Thank you very much, uh, Stanley, and thanks again, all of you, for coming. Um, this talk is really going to focus a little bit on uh, valve disease, but with some um, uh, insights into how we can manage some of these patients uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, and the post-pandemic phase. So the first thing we want to see is that um, if you look at, this is actually a, a chart showing the uh, number of patients uh, who have coronary disease. And most, of, most people are quite familiar with coronary disease, but uh, today we're going to touch base uh, mostly on uh, valve disease. So if you look at the onset of coronary disease, you can see that patients who are in the fifth decade and sixth decade, the number of patients really uh, grows significantly. And actually, if you think about looking at aortic valve and mitral valve disease, they actually parallel the CAD, uh, coronary artery disease uh, epidemiology. So again, around fifth or sixth decade, you see an up spike uh, in the uh, presence of patients presenting with aortic valve or mitral valve disease. So what's the problem about valve disease in the pandemic? Uh, the main issue is that if this is actually some data that has uh, been published from Washington, um, if you look at the amount of uh, patients who get COVID, uh, and have pre-existing valve disease, um, their mortality rates are actually quite poor. So uh, in this particular study, about 41% of patients uh, had a, a death uh, at 30 days uh, when, they, when they had um, uh, COVID-19 infections. They also then sub-analyzed uh, to see who are the patients uh, in this valve cohort that actually uh, do so badly. So if you look at this uh, chart here, the patients who are uh, less than 80, years of age and they're treated, meaning the valve has been treated, they actually have the best outcomes. And on the other hand, if the patient is elderly and has not had their valve treated, if they, if they contract uh, COVID-19, then the mortality rates uh, escalates significantly. So it shows you that um, treatment does have some impact on the outcomes. In terms of valve types, we know that um, severe mitral regurgitation and severe aortic stenosis constitutes the most common type of a significant valve disease in this cohort. And of course, now we know that even tricuspid valve problems can also be the important third valve that deserves uh, some attention. So in Singapore, there's actually, uh, we, we published this about uh, almost close to 10 years ago, looking at the types of aortic stenosis in Singapore. And in our society, because we have now um, um, gone into uh, a much more developed uh, situation, we mainly see degenerative calcific uh, aortic stenosis, so the bar on, on ye in yellow. Bicuspid valves are going to be more common because uh, this is really a congenital condition. 1% of us would have bicuspid aortic valves and some of them may deteriorate over time to lead uh, to become a stenotic. And rheumatic is now becoming very, very infrequent because of the advent of antibiotics. So we all know this uh, very uh, important uh, curve, if you see the top left, this is a curve that all the medical students and all the um, uh, trainees in cardiology would know. It's called the slippery slope. So when the patients initially have aortic stenosis, they are well, and when they develop symptoms, the mortality rates just becomes very severe and they plummet off this cliff. So this is called the slippery slope, and it's very important therefore to pick patients uh, up when they are symptomatic. Um, but now we know that actually among the asymptomatic group of patients that actually progressive uh, changes that happens in the patient. So nowadays we are even trying to pick patients even earlier, even before they're symptomatic. So if there are features in the heart that shows that the heart is not functioning well, and that's typified by the fact, uh, for example, ejection fraction or the pump function of the heart drops, then these patients may be needed to be treated earlier, even before symptoms occur. And the way to pick up these patients are pretty simple. It's still uh, auscultation as the primary tool of uh, screening. So it's not a costly uh, investment. It's really just uh, auscultation, uh, listening to the ejection systolic murmur. And if that is heard, then the patient will go on to do a transthoracic echocardiogram, which is a non-invasive uh, scan. So this is what we typically would see in a patient with uh, severe aortic stenosis. Uh, LV represents left ventricle on, on this part here, and AO is the aorta. So this valve that, that divides the left ventricle from the aorta is the aortic valve. And you can see that both leaflets here are very heavily calcified, and the valve cannot open here because it's all uh, full of calcium, and it's now become very rigid. <laughs> 
So most of us already know that the treatment of a mechanical problem like aortic stenosis requires a mechanical solution. So there isn't drugs at, at present that can soften these valves or reduce the calcium. So really the treatment is a mechanical solution. So in the past, there was only aortic valve replacement or surgery. But over the years, many of you have heard about percutaneous options like TAVI, which allows the valve to be treated without the patient having to have his chest uh, open. Um, what's new in the last uh, publication in the American uh, Guidance, American College, as well as the European College, is that now TAVI is over the last 10 years proven to be much safer and already well established. And just about a year ago, uh, they have said that everyone above 65, as long as you think that the patient is going to need a biological valve, uh, can be considered for TAVI. So it's a class one indication now uh, for patients above the age of 65. So it's no longer high risk, low risk or anything. It's all patients above 65, if you think that the patient may need a biological valve and suitable anat anatomically for uh, TAVI, that can be considered uh, in these patients. Obviously, surgery will still have an option for some patients who are anatomically not suitable for TAVI. And for very young patients, less than 65, uh, surgery still remains a very important first choice because in these cases, the durability of the valve from a surgical implant uh, may be, uh, have a longer uh, historical basis. So what about the situation of TAVI in, uh, in the pandemic? So this is a, a paper we put out um, last year uh, during the middle of the pandemic with a group of colleagues uh, in, in, in Asia as well as uh, Asia Pacific. And we looked at uh, what were the com commonalities of the patients that were coming to our hospitals. And this was the guidance that stated that, um, that put, put forth a suggestion that we shouldn't delay uh, treating these patients with aortic stenosis, even in the pandemic. So they should be classified as a high risk subset and there shouldn't be significant delays to their treatment. So this provides uh, uh, guidance in that patients who have symptoms typically would fall into the urgent or semi-urgent uh, uh, bar and they should be expedited in terms of the treatment. Because as you know, patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, uh, they can have an event of sudden death uh, anytime in the first two years. The additional benefit, of course, with the transcatheter approach is also that in a public hospital, there will, uh, or is it even in any, any healthcare setting, uh, it minimizes ICU stays, and therefore resource utilization in terms of preserving ICU beds was a priority at that time. I'm gonna switch gears now into a second valve. It's called a mitral valve, and this is uh, a little bit less uh, well known than the uh, aortic valve, I would say, but now it's uh, getting a bit more focused. There are multiple ways these valves can, this valve can fail. Um, it could be a degeneration of the valve leaflets, or it could be, say, kind of previous infections, or even heart failure can result in uh, what we call functional mitral regurgitation, where the valves are actually not damaged, but pulled apart because the heart is now swollen. So unlike aortic stenosis, where most people remember that this is actually a, a patients who are older, the patients with mitral regurgitation can be middle-aged. They have no real specific age range because it depends on when the valve starts to fail. They have symptoms very typical of breathlessness, uh, fatigue or palpitations. And oftentimes, again, the stethoscope can pick up this uh, condition very easily with a pen systolic murmur. And oftentimes, we also pick it up on the ECG because the ECG often shows left ventricular hypertrophy with tall um, uh, R waves and also LVH uh, with especially with volume loading patterns. So if you see an LVH loading uh, with a volume loading pattern uh, and a patient has a murmur, you would think uh, mitral regurgitation. And echo again is there to confirm the diagnosis. So this is the pandemic situation. You can see there was a big dip in terms, this is US data, big dip in terms of the cardiac surgery that was done during the uh, height of the pandemic. And then there's some recovery. And you can see why it's so, because um, with mitral regurgitation, uh, surgery is uh, open surgery. And um, that takes up uh, ICU resources. So there was a, a big drop in, in the uh, uh, number of cases that were done. And now gradually there's a rebound. So these are the two options that patients have. The first, of course, is a traditional open chest surgery, which is uh, essentially opening up the chest, finding the valve, uh, stitching, uh, cutting away the, the areas of the valve that don't function, and then repairing it with sutures and a ring. And now, of course, we have the alternative, which is the mitral valve uh, clip procedure, where we actually try to pull the anterior and posterior leaflet of the valve together, leaving a clip implanted in the center, uh, 
and reducing the regurgitation. So what are the types of mitral valve regurgitation uh, or valve disease that we know about? So the most common uh, cause is what we call degenerative uh, mitral valve disease. You will hear of this, uh, called, uh, it's called mitral valve prolapse. This is when the valve itself is uh, thickened, its tissue is actually quite weak, and they have a whole spectrum of presentation. Some just having one area, one small area of the valve that is weakened, what we call the FED, or fibroelastic deficiency, all the way to the most extreme case called Barlow's, where the entire valve, all the segments of the valve are all diseased. So these are the valves that typically uh, manifest uh, because they have uh, weakened tissue. And so over time, they tend to either have a ruptured cord or they have a flail leaflet. So they, they lead to significant regurgitation. This is an area called uh, secondary mitral valve regurgitation. Um, this is a little bit different. Here, the valve tissue itself is not damaged. But what happens is uh, patients who, who develop heart failure for whatever reason, say ischemic heart disease, or myocarditis, or say post-treatment or chemotherapy-related cardiomyopathy, if the ventricle or the heart becomes enlarged, then it pulls the anterior and posterior leaflets of the mitral valve apart, and therefore you have this central regurgitation. And this is what we call functional regurgitation, where the valve itself is not damaged but pulled apart because the heart chamber is uh, dilated and enlarged. And again, uh, recent studies, this is just two years ago published, that shows that in these patients, if you uh, treat the patients with the mitral clip procedure on top of the heart failure medications, you have a close to 50% reduction in hospitalization rates as well as mortality. So very impactful if you select the right patients uh, for treatment. And finally, I'll come to the third uh, type of valve disease. Um, uh, it's called a tricuspid valve. Again, this is, we call it the forgotten valve until recently. Forgotten because Many times there wasn't much solution to treat these patients. And this is kind of left, uh, patients are kind of left alone, oftentimes uh, given diuretics and allowed to, uh, to kind of fade away uh, over time. So now there are new technologies. So again, like the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve is the close cousin. And there are three leaflets here. And you can see what are the types of disease that these patients can have. They can have perforations or tears of the valve. And this is typically in the setting of endocarditis. This could happen in, say, in patients with a uh, history of IV drug abuse before where they inject themselves and they get infections of this valve. Or more commonly nowadays, we see a lot of patients with pacemakers, sometimes with the lead of the pacemaker pressing on one of the valves and over time uh, causing regurgitation from the, from the valve itself. And lastly, again, similar to the heart failure patients where the heart chamber is dilated, the tricuspid valve can function exactly the same way where the valve is uh, pulled apart by the enlarged ventricle leading to regurgitation. So therefore, again, you have what is called primary or secondary uh, regurgitation. Primary when the valve itself is damaged and secondary when the valve itself is not damaged but pulled apart because of an enlarged heart chamber. So how does our, um, what is the prognosis of patients with tricuspid regurgitation uh, in Singapore? And we looked at this group of patients from again from the university and this over a 10 years uh, uh, number of patients, um, close to about 900 patients, a quarter of them had a mortal high mortality rate at one year. So we lose, if the patient has severe tricuspid regurgitation, um, we lose about a quarter of them uh, in a year. So it's a very significant amount of uh, uh, mortality. So of course we can also judge the patient's uh, prognosis based on how severe the leakage is. In fact, nowadays, if we do echo, we can actually size the heart chamber, size the right ventricle, uh, look at the ventricle function, and then prognosticate now. Certain patients will do better. Certain patients will have a very, very severe short-term outcome of high-risk mortality. Those need to be treated early. And so these are the typical three uh, phenotypes that we see, um, patients with so-called functional regurgitation. So if you look at tricuspid regurgitation, the most common are uh, functional, where a dilation occurs and the valve leaflets are pulled apart. Even among this group, there are three major groups that you will see, three phenotypes. The first is patients who have atrial fit for a long time. So in those cases, they have a very, very large uh, left atrium and right atrium. And especially the right atrium tends to become so large that the annulus now becomes so dilated and the valve leaflets fail to touch each other. We call it a Mickey Mouse picture where the two atriums look like the ears of Mickey Mouse. 
And then you have the uh, left heart disease patients who have, for example, ischemic heart disease, uh, who have had previous myocardial infarction. Those patients can also have um, severe tricuspid regurgitation. And the last one is the least common. These are patients previously perhaps have uh, uh, inferior myocardial infarction from the right coronary artery or RV infarct, and they have just isolated left ventricle uh, problems. So what's the real clinical problem with uh, tricuspid regurgitation? As you know, most of the blood from the right ventricle is pumped to the pulmonary artery to allow it to receive oxygen and then recirculate again. And the veins of our, of our veins, of our, of our liver, our kidney, all has to drain into the IVC, and then all this gets into the right heart chamber and pumped all into the pulmonary arteries. And so what happens if you have severe regurgitation of the tricuspid valve? Then each time the tricuspid valve, each time the heart pumps or the right ventricle pumps or in systole, all the blood is going to be redirected in the wrong direction. So blood is going to go down into your IVC instead of going back to the heart. So everything is going to be pushed down into the IVC. And what then happens is veins that drain blood from the hepatic veins are not going to be able to drain blood back into the IVC. And the same for the kidney, it can't, it can't drain blood back into the IVC. And what happens in these patients? They get cirrhosis because of the hepatic, chronic hepatic congestion and they get cardiorenal syndrome, they get renal failure because the, the hepatic veins are congested. And as we diurese these patients, you find their kidney function get worse and worse sometimes because they just cannot generate enough cardiac output and the congestion remains severe. So this is a typical picture that you will find from Nettus. Uh, and this will be a patient, very edematous, very swollen, has a significant pedal edema. Uh, maybe the JVP is pulsating. And this is a typical, uh, this is a typical feature of, uh, of tricuspid, severe tricuspid regurgitation. And I always tell the students that I teach as well that um, tricuspid regurgitation really is like cancer. They don't present breath, uh, very breathless like a severe AS or severe mitral regurgitation, but they are very chronic, very, very chronic kind of uh, end-stage liver disease. Uh, uh, they present like, like end-stage liver disease. So the treatment remains uh, in the past only diuretics. There was no other options. And most times surgeons don't want to operate on tricuspid valve because it's a very high risk uh, procedure by the time they have severe symptomatic tricuspid regurgitation. And some of them present already with Charles B or C uh, liver cirrhosis. So already very advanced uh, disease. So it's very high risk for them to undertake open surgery. So now um, we have uh, some new uh, techniques of treating them mechanically. Again, similar to the um, uh, mitral valve, there's an option to put a clip on the tricuspid valve as well. Try to bring the leaflets that are not uh, well opposed together so they tighten the valve and reduce the regurgitation. And then there's also this um, um, option of doing what we call cable implants. So you know our IVC and SVC, when we were very young, some of them actually may have little valves there. But over time, embryo embryologically, as we grew, we didn't, need, we didn't need those valves. So what the engineers have done is now recreate these two uh, valves that you implant in the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And what then happens is that you actually shield the organs from the adverse effects of the regurgitation. So you actually allow uh, still uh, the pressure, you actually protect the kidneys and the liver from uh, being congested with severe tricuspid regurgitation. So I would like to conclude that a patient who has significant valvular heart disease, especially in this situation of the pandemic, it's really a problem if they, if they get COVID-19 because the prognosis, as you've seen from those publications, are quite significantly impaired. Um, we have to avoid delays in procedure because uh, it's been shown, at least for aortic stenosis, that any delay will lead to poor outcomes. Um, the disease is not difficult to pick up. It's all about clinical uh, auscultation and you should be able to pick up quite easily with a stethoscope. And uh, fortunately, some of these treatments can be less invasive nowadays uh, because there are these uh, percutaneous techniques that we can explore, uh, which doesn't require the patient to have uh, big uh, open surgery. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.